but I came yes. to praise the Lord. Yes. Amen. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I just feel like something. Come on. 
Come on. I was about to say, if it's going to happen, it's going to be because of him. But then it hit me. No, no, son. When it happens. Brother David, I didn't think they either didn't hear that or they don't believe it.
place. Amen. Amen. Welcome to Life Point Church. On this Sunday morning, if you're a guest or visitor today, we welcome you. How do we feel about our guests and visitors? If you're watching live, we thank you for watching live. I want to say this as always. You may be seated if you want to. Let's continue to worship and just let the Lord have his way. Amen.
bless you. The Bible said to give honor where honor is due. And uh, we've been looking and uh, found some new honor to give. And that's right. That's right. We're going we're gonna to do it. And uh, Sister Rima, are you ready? Why don't y'all be seated for just a moment? Let's get a microphone for Sister, for Sister Rima Spurgeon. I don't know how, how, how many times she's been out front and with a microphone in front of the church. It might be the first time. But we got something special we want to do.
the harder work you're fixing to be doing with some new changes. And Amen. so God bless you. Let's give all of our Sunday school a big hand. Awesome, awesome, awesome. He's talking about those uh, learning how to receive honor. I learned to receive it so that I could give it. Amen. And I'm standing up here to give honor to somebody. And uh, obviously, he's family, but he's also my pastor. And obviously, she's my mother-in-law, but also my first lady. And I want them to come. For those that don't know, today is 11 years that they've been pastoring the Rock Church. She said, but in all fairness, 
That was the worst message <laughs> I have ever heard in my life. His name was L.F.R. Reed, and he said, all of a sudden, the Spirit hit me and said, L.F.R., don't get puffed down. <laughs> so during the highs and the lows, you know, we got, we've got we got to ride the wave. We're not in control of the ocean. Right. And it's got to stay going the right direction. And I thank you. I don't know what's in here, but my wife's going to take it anyway. So uh, whatever it is, it's a card or a check or a $20 bill. It's going to be hers. What, what's up? Uh, What's mine is hers, and what's hers is hers. <laughs> so, I love you. You really are the best. And I want you to give yourself a hand clap. Without you, I wouldn't be here. You did all that works to you. God bless you. You're the best.
Amen. 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 Remember next week, Brother Scott Meeks is going to be here. He's a victory preacher. He's a great evangelist. And uh, I'm excited about having him here with us. Hey, if your legs will let you, <clears throat> stand up and clear your voice. <clears throat> Get ready. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, that was deep. <laughs> yeah. I want to go back and, and get one. I want to go back and get one. And it goes like this. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming love.
God bless you. Glad that I made it another year to see your birthday. <laughs> Amen. God bless you all. So honored to be here. Thank you, singers. Y'all are still the best. spoke with the doctor right at 10 o'clock and uh, uh, the bishop is uh, by, by all accounts it's going to be okay. Yes. Yes. Now, with that having been said, I know some of you are going to be let down about this, but I just pray you have understanding. Tomorrow night, we were going to meet and give our financial reports. All right. The bishop is on our board. He was here when there were zero members. He's super excited about that meeting, and he will not be able to attend. So we're going to reschedule that. For one person, yes. 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 And if, you know, if, you know, I, I, I just trust you understand that, yes. and, and I, I believe you do, and everything will be okay. We will will plan to do this again. We've got two or three major weekends. Matter of fact, I thought, you know, it would be better on a Sunday night. Yes. Right. But we don't have a Sunday night until the week after Mother's Day. So we'll be waiting six weeks. And if we want to do that, I guess we could. Yeah. But uh, the quickest we can get back to that meeting would be a Monday night. The 25th of April. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm gonna, sometimes you just have to do things, and then other other times, uh, opinions are, are are very important. This is all I want. This is all I'm curious about. For the people that it would be better on a Sunday night, I'd like to see your hand. Okay, well then there you go. It's happening on Monday. So that'll be April 25th, and, and we'll get those of you that work, there's, there's two or three, um, 25th of April, we'll, we'll make sure that uh, those of you that can't be here uh, will get all the information that you need. And I thank you. Is that okay? Do y'all understand? Are we good? Hey Amen. I just, uh, he's, he's super excited. The church has never been in a shape like it's in right now financially, and uh, there's some some plans and some talks and things going forward right now and things that are on the move and happening and uh, he just wants to be here and I know I know he wants to chime in and I think I think that he, he deserves that he deserves that God bless you if I'll preach you the truth today will you help me yes We've got a celebration, it sounds like, and y'all don't know how happy I am. Uh, this will be our 12th. If I make it to Easter and you make it to Easter, it'll be our 12th Easter to celebrate together. Amen. What a great, great time. I'm looking so forward to that. And this next weekend, again, I say we'll go to I'm looking forward to that. And uh, we're just going to have a wonderful time these next few weeks. And uh, our calendar's filling up. We're fixing to put it out to everybody. Get a bulletin. There's 21 announcements on that bulletin today, counting the one that says Jesus is Lord on the front. 20 of ours. Yeah. Amen. And so that's a that's a good thing. So thank you. Well, I thought I saw Sister Heather, but I was going to thank her. Oh, you, did you mind? I, I thought I was going crazy for a minute. Because, yeah, for for. All your hard work and getting us going, and Sister Amanda is helping and very helping to bring you to the White House and wonderful job. And uh, we mentioned it already, but I'm glad you're here to hear it. And it uh, looks good. Amen. God bless you. I'm going to be teaching and preaching to you today uh, from a subject that's uh, not real popular. Even on a celebration day, you'll understand why here in a little bit. Uh, but it's just that time. And I'm just going to share with you the words of the Lord. Just that, that's it. I mean, if, 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 that, if that hurts us, uh, we really needed it. 
You know, the Bible said the word cuts us deep right. to the dividing of the bone from the marrow. Yes. So that's a deep cut. And when I was a kid, we used to teach, teach, tease each other about our pocket knives. I said, this is going to cut you three ways, deep, wide, and continuously. <laughs> and uh, the word of the Lord is kind of like that. And so let's read together. We're going to go to the book of Luke, chapter 16. And just promise me this, you will not bail out. If I ever preach heaven, I'll show how we can miss it. If I ever preach hell, I'll show how we can miss it. And so uh, I want to I want to preach in balance. I want to be right. I know we're in the right vein this morning. And then we'll all go over and smile at each other and have a great time when service is over. Amen. Luke 16 and 19. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. Don't let that be too sobering to you. Those are the words of the Lord Jesus, the one who loved us so much he laid down his life for us. Those are his words. And I want to preach to you a few minutes on this thought. Please, please, please stay with me to the end. If you, if you don't, you're going to miss out. The good things about hell. Probably never heard that, have you? The good things about hell. Lord, we love you. I'm so unworthy to stand behind this desk. And Lord, none of us by earning, have earned the right to hear your word, to be spared by your word, to be touched or healed or delivered by your word. But you're worthy of all we can do for you and all the praise we can give you. Just ask you to move us with your message today. Help us to hear, understand, and respond. And with a special anointing, touch every heart. Please start with mine, as you already have over the last few days is this thought has just taken over my mind just help us help us leave here better than we came we'll give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus mighty name we pray Amen. if you can still praise him yeah. after that little bit of song to read give him a big hand You may be seated. God bless you to our guests. We're so honored that you're here. And we preach more love and more mercy and more hope from this pulpit, arguably, than any other pulpit in the world. Sometimes you got to get in the weeds. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. The good things about hell. The Lord carried me on a little journey. I, I won't even try to be like the apostle and say whether I was in the spirit or not in the spirit. I don't know. I, I, I won't go to that degree, but I was at the house and, you know, the whole deal with dad and he's carried to the, you know, thought he was having a heart attack in the hospital and the whole deal. And I, I was praying. I was kind of in a little deeper place and a little deeper thought and thinking, man, it's our anniversary tomorrow. It's 11 years. I mean, that's it's a lot of messages. That's a lot of conferencing. That's a, that's a lot of talking. That's a lot of counsel. A lot of weddings and funerals and baby dedications. And it's just been an incredible 11 years. And I'm just ready to go and just drop the hammer on the love of the Lord. You know, I'm, I'm ready. But... 
for about 10 or 12 days. There's been a thought in my mind. And at first I brushed it off and maybe I wasn't exactly prayed up for the moment or maybe I got hit broadside with it. When I first heard it, I said, nah, nah, that's, that's, we're, we're in a really, really, really good place and I'm, I, that's, that's not, that's not what needs to be said. Then I recognize the voice. And so last night I got home and yes, I was tired, I was weary. But I was still thinking about today. I thought about just calling a couple of ministers in the church and saying, hey, it's celebration day. Y'all just y'all just come, just let it all hang out. Just preach. Just do what you feel. The Lord carried me on a little journey. And in that journey, I was standing right here on the edge of this pulpit. In my mind, I, I could see this. And whether I was out there somewhere or just the Lord was showing me or leading, I don't know what, what degree of spiritual I may have been in. But I was standing right here and something spoke to my heart. I, I looked out across and all around me, 360 degrees, I didn't see any people, I didn't see any faces, I didn't see the pews, I could just see the pulpit. That's all I could see was the top of this desk. Really, the, this corner was really all I could see. And I was standing there, right here on this corner. I was standing up, and I was looking down on all of this. And the Lord just said, touch it. Step out on it. And I looked at it, and it, it looked like ice. And I said, well, okay, you know, okay, and, so I reached out, and as soon as my foot touched it, it felt like ice. And in my spirit, I was encouraged to put a little pressure on it, and I did, and it broke. Brother Joe, just that quick, the Lord said, hell has frozen over in a lot of pulpits, and it's developing a crust in yours. But you broke the ice. Yes. Now you got to bring the word. Amen. I just want to tell you that there is a heaven to gain. And we love to rejoice about it. We love to sing about it. But we better not ever forget that there's a hell to shun that's just as real and just as deep and just as literal and just as factual. Sure as there are streets of gold, there's a lake of fire. I just can't stand here today one more service and continue to help usher in and preach in the miracles and the signs and the wonders of the Lord while some may just slip away because they walk on the ice it's so thick. So I want to preach to you today the good things about hell. I want to be obedient in my spirit. The Lord is writing. This is red letter edition. And he says there's a rich man that died and was buried. And then there was a poor man that died and he was carried into the bosom of Abraham. I studied that out. It was a place of comfort. It was a place where he knew he was okay. It was a place where he knew that eternity was his. And he had, he had gained and he had shunned all the right things. He was there. Didn't have a lot in this world, but now after his death, he is safe. He's sound. He would be in now what we would call heaven. This is before the crucifixion, the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so this is the way it's presented is, is the bosom of Abraham. 
Some would talk about heaven and talk about eternity. This one is a totally different setting. And it's a, it's a comparison of two spirits is all it is right here. But it shows us so much. And so today as a pastor and, and an under-shepherd, I, I just have to remind us today that if we believe the words of the Lord, we've got to believe them all. That's right. And so I just want to share with you some good things about hell. I, I've, I've dug deep into it and I, I want to share them with you because as I've never believed or uh, understood or recognized before, there's some good things about hell. Are you, are everybody good? Yeah. Luke 16 and 23. So this is the death of the rich man. This is the next verse. The Bible says he was buried, but the next verse says... And in hell, he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. I want to tell you something. From hell, you'll have good vision. Blind people all across the world, people that would, that would, that would literally give an arm to be able to see again. But in hell, Everybody there is going to have good vision. That's good. That's good. It's, 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 one, it's one of the good things. He can see more clearly and further than ever. He never seemed to see the poor man before. He never seemed, oh my God. He never seemed to see the lost soul that was lying by his door. That was in need. He never seen, he never did see the need to support the ministry that would bring in those that were hurting. He couldn't see that until he got to hell. And when he got to hell, he could see and he could recognize what he had missed. Hell brings good vision. He can see into eternity. He can see the peace that now passes understanding for a poor man. He can see the comfort and a place of eternal security. We've dreamed of seeing these things in this life. We've dreamed of seeing them in prayer. We've dreamed of having visions of them from the altar, from the pulpit. And I'm going to tell you where you're going to see the comforts of heaven is from hell. That's good. To see the comforts of heaven. We all want to see that. But from where we see it is going to matter. Yes. Y'all just help me. 16 and 24. And this is still talking about the rich man. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus. He's talking about the poor man, Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. He had a voice. He didn't speak about Lazarus before. He was, he was a nothing. He was a nobody that lay there, and his dogs came out and licked the sores. He would have just desired to have crumbs from this rich man's table, but he wouldn't give him the time of day. Now, all of a sudden, He's got a voice that can reach into another place. Oh, I have a voice. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. He cried out for the first time that we ever read or hear or recognize or understand, whether it be by parable or by writings indeed. The fact is, Jesus Christ said, the rich man cried out to the Father of humanity. There's no history of him ever done that before. <coughs> Have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I'm tormented in this flame. He could still desire an ice cold drink of water. Oh, that's a good thing. There's nothing like being on a lawnmower or a chainsaw and working hard all day through July and August in Texas and, and just getting you a big old drink. This guy could recognize now for the first time the importance of a cold drink. 
That was a good thing. Maybe all is not lost after all. So far we know, we see, we thirst, and we have a voice. Those are good things. Verse 25, And Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art in torment. He can see the comforts. He's reminded of the comforts. He's reminded of how good life was from hell. We'll be able to remember all the creature comforts of life. That's a good thing to be able to remember what God has blessed us with. Are y'all helping me? He can still see comforts. He can still understand drawing. And more than anything in that particular verse, he recognizes that the poor man, the man he didn't care about, that only had to deal with evil things in this life, he realizes he's okay. So all of a sudden, there's another spirit that starts brewing inside the sky that had no apparent care in the world. But now he recognizes that the guy he didn't care about, somebody else is taking care of it. There's an evangelistic spirit that starts sliding into eternity that says, don't worry, he's okay now. Luke 16 and 26. And Abraham's still speaking to him. And decide all this between us and you, there's a great gulf fix. So that they which would pass from you hence to you cannot. Neither can they pass to us that would come from hence. He recognizes that everybody that makes it to heaven, there's no way then to be lost. Abraham tells him, hey, don't worry about it because one of the problems is is now that he's made it, it'll never be unmade. From hell, he recognizes if I could have made it there, I'd have always been there. The good things of hell, knowing that your loved ones that made it can never be lost. Oh, what a comforting thing. Wow. The rich man speaks in 27. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. All of a sudden, evangelism gets real deep. He wants to make sure that his brothers hear the word of God. He wants to make sure that his neighbor hears about heaven and about hell. He didn't care before. He was caught up in his life. He was caught up in his money. He was caught up in his little cliques and his clans and his groups. And it never mattered to him before. But all of a sudden, from hell, he recognizes his family could be lost. And a spirit of evangelism comes over him and he says, Somebody help me save my brother. <laughs> Nobody's got to wait to get to hell to get an evangelistic spirit. We don't have to wait to get to hell to decide we want somebody else to be saved. Oh, it's a good thing from hell that he wanted somebody to be saved. But the sad thing is there was nothing he could do about it. Go tell my brothers. Go tell my friend. Go tell my neighborhood. Brothers right there has a broad meaning. Although he had five brothers, it also has the meaning of anybody that will listen. Go tell them. Don't come here. Why is it that some folks would have to go through so much hell before they can get a spirit of evangelism to try to help save the world? When while we're trying to save the world, the Lord will always turn that favor back to us. We don't have to wait. To are lost to realize our brother needs us. Amen. The good things of hell. He got evangelistic real quick. He began to care about lost souls he never cared about before. 
It's an awesome thing. But it don't have to be done from hell. Luke 16 and 29, Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear. Here's what he's saying. They've got the Bible. And they've got everybody that would talk to them now. That's what he says to him. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. What Jesus Christ is telling us right here in red letter edition, that if you can have a conversation from hell unto heaven, that they, while there's still hope, Get them to church now. Get them to the altar now. Get them in the baptistry now. Get them, get them off of the addiction now. Get them out of their hang-ups now. Get them out of their hookups now. Don't wait till you get to hell to realize they're lost. It's a good quality, but that's not where we want to learn it. Come on, are y'all helping me right now? I know it's probably not what we were expecting on 11 years of anniversary today, but I just got to preach to you that there's some qualities from hell that we don't want. There's some spirits from hell that will only wake up in some people when they get there. And they're good things, but they can be learned on this side. We don't have to be lost to recognize the lost. We don't have to be lost to reach out to those that can't help themselves. We don't have to be lost to get evangelistic. We don't have to be lost to witness to our neighbor, to our brother, to our sister. We don't have to be lost to take a word of hope to our job, to our employment, to the people we work with. We don't have to be lost to reach into our family reunion. He's showing us in this word you can do it now. Right. <laughs> from hell he was interested in preaching from hell he wanted someone to preach to his brothers he suddenly loved the word of God didn't care too much before wasn't interested didn't ever read his bible apparently didn't do much because as Abraham was speaking to him in Jesus Christ with his voice and his words, he said, well, but if we could do this. See, he knew about it, but didn't care enough about it to be saved. I want to tell some people in this place today, the worst thing that can happen is to die lost. But the worst thing that can happen on top of that would be to die lost knowing the truth. Right. right. Lastly, along this line, I want to share something else Jesus said. He's speaking in the spiritual concerning getting rid of anything that would keep you from eternal salvation. Here's how he words it in Mark 9. New book, new chapter, 43. He's speaking in the spiritual right here. But listen, listen to this, listen to this and put it in correct context. If I hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go to hell. Amen. Into the fire that never shall be quenched. Well, we know this. As sinners, nobody would have hands. Amen. Nobody would. So he's putting this on the spiritual level and he's saying, if there's anything at all that's more important to you than God, and his church and his truth. Not quench. 
Here's what he's saying again. It would be better for you to not even be able to walk into a place than to walk in and be lost. I'd rather see you running around sitting on a skateboard with no legs into heaven and be restored on streets of gold than to go with all your faculties to hell. Come on. Somebody hear me right now. Whatever it is that divides you from truth, whatever it is that divides you from commitment, whatever Divide you from total submission. That thing needs to go. My mind, verse 47. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It's better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes and be cast into hellfire. What's he saying? If it's your feet, if it's your hands, if it's your eyes. Anything that's going on, it would be better that you didn't have that. That's right. And go to heaven and let me restore it to you. That's right. Then to go to hell having all your parts. And that last verse 48 says, we're there, not T-H-E-R, but there, ownership, you, I, whoever were to go to hell. Where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. The key word right there is worm. Back in the olden days, you go back a long ways. When they very first started looking at people and understanding what was inside the human skull, when you look at the brain, it looks like a very tight ball of intestines. The word came forth out of that, that the brain is the worm. It just looks like worms. Go look at the picture. Go look at it. And, and, and so the writer says right here, at the words of Jesus Christ, he said, the worm dieth not as we study deep into that. What is that? The brain will never die. Isn't it a beautiful thing when we deal with forgetfulness and we deal with people that have dementia and, and, and certain types of things, Alzheimer's and things that, that really torture a person. They think about things they want to say them and they can't make it happen or, or they know, they just, they, they just I wonder about me sometimes. I'll be mid-sentence. I think I've got the 50-somethings. And it's mid-sentence. And go, uh, what were we just talking about? Well, let me tell you one of the good things about hell. You have a good memory. That's right. That's right. The worm will never die. Right. Now hear me close. You'll remember every sermon. That's right. You'll remember every call to prayer. Uh -huh. You'll remember every opportunity to be baptized. Yeah. You'll remember every opportunity to clean life up a little bit. Yeah. You'll remember every time or opportunity to be faithful to your husband. Be faithful to your wife. You'll, be, you'll remember every opportunity, every off-ramp that God gave you to avoid that addiction and that habit and that problem. That will never die. One of the good things about hell is you'll have a memory. Every check, every time you went to go, turn that spirit away. God said, that will never die. That opportunity, that hope, that promise that will never die. Every time the pastor gave an opportunity, every time the Spirit led you at night and said, won't you just creep in the living room and talk to me for a little bit? I've got something to say to you. Every time the Spirit of the Lord said, if you lead your sons, if you lead your daughters, they'll follow you to a place of salvation and completion. I'll make it right. In hell, you'll never forget the opportunities. The good things about hell, we'll see, we'll know, we'll care. We'll still be able to thirst. We'll still be able to feel. We'll still be able to see those that made it. We'll want those on the earth to be saved. And, and there's a great gulf that they can't come to me and I can't go to them. And they can't come to me and I can't go to them. But I can see these are lost and these are saved and I can't do nothing about it. I can't forget. I can see it. 
I can't put it away. Every time I could have said yes, I said no. Every time I could have said no, but said yes. My brain, the worm, will never die. Every time I rejected the Lord, every sermon I heard, every song I heard, every time I felt a nudge and my pride took over. I remember that. Every time I was encouraged, every time I did not extend a hand of forgiveness. You know, we're so easy, quickly sometimes to judge. People do something, we just see two or three little areas of their life, and all of a sudden we write them off. Some people do. I do my best to never do it, but I'm not perfect. Sometimes I start having doubts, and I start going, oh God, turn me over, turn me, turn me inside out, and let me understand and realize that I crossed that bridge one time. Yeah. And somebody was reaching for me. Yeah. And sometimes it's so easy just to write people off. They don't act like we do. They don't do what we do. They don't come from where we come from. And it's easy just to say, look out, Lazarus. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not stepping out tonight. I don't want to be guilty in hell of not caring for anyone. The beautiful thing about that is I will care. I'll never forget that spirit that draws me, that evangelistic spirit that says, you got to be saved. you got to repent. you got to do what's right. you got to come on. I know you failed. I know you dropped the ball. I know, I know you're not where you used to be. I know you've slipped in some areas. I know that. But, but I'm not judging you today. Eternity will judge you. You judge yourself for eternity. Today I'm saying there's hope. If you've got breath, you've got hope. If you've got life, you've got hope. If you can hear the message, you can respond to the message. hell or, or anything about hell without showing you how to avoid it. They asked Simon Peter, how do we avoid it? How are we saved? When you ask how you saved, you're asking how do we avoid being lost? Right. Right. It's all one question in the same verbiage. It's just posed a different way. How do I avoid being lost? Or how am I saved? How do I have the experience? Or how do I pass it up? And here's what Peter said. Now when they heard this, they heard a sermon that was red hot, fiery, anointed of the Holy Ghost. They were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? If we don't want to find out the good things about hell, here's what Peter said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name, come on, of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promises unto you and to your children yeah. and to all that are far off even as many as the Lord our God shall call. I want somebody to hear me. I'm not looking for hellish memories. I'm looking for heavenly memories. I'm not looking to look back and wish yeah. I had done different. I'm looking to press forward and be glad I've the right choices that I made. Somebody yeah. hear me on Sunday morning. I'm done, Sister Beckham. Somebody hear me right now. Today we have an opportunity. Jesus Christ said today is the day of salvation. Now is the time of repentance. Now is the time to turn away. Don't wait until it's too late. I hear arguments. I hear debates all the time. They're somewhat foolish, although fun and intriguing. When's the Lord coming back? Well, Two-thirds of the world had not been destroyed by fire yet. The temple had not been torn down yet. There had not been this or there had not been that. The Antichrist, I want to tell you something, folks. For just a moment, forget all that. Yeah. Right. Right. You might not make it out of this driveway. Right. Right. Yeah. For somebody, eternity comes every two seconds in this nation. One, two, somebody's eternity just started. One, Two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. Right. Folks, that quick he turns his decided. Right. I have to tell you when when they called me, I I, I talked to Dad. He he was telling my mom he, she was trying to get him to call the call the hospital, call the ambulance, do something. He wouldn't do it. He was being hard-headed. 
Like, like we all can be sometimes. And he said, no, he wasn't. You can, you can go in your race system. He said, no, I don't want to do that. And, and, and she called me and she said, Rusty, would you talk to your father? <laughs> I said, what's the deal? And she said, I'm trying to get him to go to the hospital. And he keeps saying, just call Rusty. <laughs> I don't know I said, what's going on? Of course, my wife, man, you may not know this, she was working on an ambulance when we married, and that was going to be her career, and look here. And so immediately her, her medical mind starts kicking in, and she says, what's going on? And he says, you know, he's hurting his chest. She looks at me, and she says, and I'm like, duh. And then she says, are you hurting down your arm? He said, yes. And she goes. She said, are you hurting in your jaw, puppy? He said, matter of fact, I am. Have you, have you, been, have you been throwing up? Have you been, oh, yeah, two or three times. She said. And I said, Dad. Call ambulance. He said, I want to call ambulance. And I said, they won't, they won't pick you up. They get there and find out you're fine. They won't even bill you. Call ambulance. And I said, Mom, if you don't want to call ambulance, you call ambulance. Right. Don't call me. Call ambulance. <laughs> so they did, and here we are now. But in just a few moments, Sister Williams, is that how it went? You were there. That, that pretty close encounter. She was there visiting with them. She heard the conversation. Hey, somebody hear me right now. And I'm going to just say it because it's my dad. It's not yours. But yesterday, one, two. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. The bishop's number's coming. My number's coming. Your number's coming. You can wait on the temple. You can wait on nuclear war. You can look for the Antichrist. I just want to be ready for Jesus Christ. Nobody here. Nobody, not one single person here. The Bible said that it's His will that every person should come to the salvation knowledge of Jesus Christ. He said, It's for whosoever will let him come. If he knocks, it'll be open. If he asks, it'll be answered. If he seeks, he'll find. If he's thirsty, not only will I give him a drink, but I'll cause to flow from inside him rivers of living water. What are rivers flowing from us do? That helps other folks drink. When the Holy Ghost fills you up and flows through you and from you and about you, it helps change the environment of other people around you. Come on, I just want to stand to our feet right now. I don't want to know about the good things of hell from that side. But I want to follow what an anointed Simon Peter preached on that wonderful and beautiful day of Pentecost where he said, it's pretty easy, y'all. It's pretty easy. He didn't say, go sell everything you got. He didn't say, turn everything you have in. He didn't say, get rid of everything. He didn't do that. He simply said, repent. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And then there's the one place, there's not the promise of the Holy Ghost anywhere else. There's a recipe to salvation. And without all the ingredients, we don't end up with salvation. Oh, you can get touched. You can feel the spirit move. You can get the heebie-jeebies. You can get stuff run up down your spine. You can do that. But once 
once you've repented, once you've been baptized in his name, he said, those that are buried with me will rise with me. He was talking about baptism, buried, not sprinkled, not splattered, but buried. And then he made a promise. Shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. I have to talk about this and it, it, it won't bring any more pain. Today would be my mother-in-law's birthday. And their anniversary. As most of you know, he just passed away in 2020, November. But I baptized him on Easter weekend of 1998. So two years to 2000. 20 years to 2020. For 22 years. We just held on to a shell. Repent and be baptized. Turn your wicked ways. Yes. And you shall. Yes. Now I can't tell you there wasn't times we didn't question the Lord and say, but God, you said shall. He's turned away. He goes to church. He's on the mowing team. He supports everything. He, he's, he's a good man. And you said shall. Where's the promise now? Just before he got in the ambulance, 12 hours later, he would be unconscious. This following day, less than 24 hours, he'd be unconscious to never wake up and say a word that we could understand again. But a pastor went to him and said, H.J., Let's pray together. While we were still on our way to Louisiana, trying to get to him, and they began to pray, and the Spirit of the Lord moved on my father-in-law 22 plus years later, hanging on a shell. And the Lord miraculously filled him with the Spirit. Four hours later, after we got to see him and celebrate with him, they put him into an induced coma that he never woke up out of. And I stood over his casket on that day, weeping. But something inside me said, there's still that shell, you've got to talk about it. Because there's a promise. And if you want that promise, you repent, turn from your ways, and take on the name of Jesus Christ in water baptism. And then there's a shout. There's a shout. They'll hang on for 22 years. So I'm just curious. Is there anybody that would like to come to the altar today and just make sure all is well?